You're listening to The Drag. Back in October of 2022, I made the five-hour drive from Austin, where I currently live, to my hometown of Texarkana. Halloween was only a week away. Texas doesn't normally see what most would consider fall weather, and the trees stay green and brown the entire year. But last year, on my drive, red and yellow leaves lined both sides of the highway. I made this drive a lot in college, but this time it was for a specific reason. I was in town to watch a Halloween play, and the plot revolved around the story of the Phantom Killer. I knew I couldn't miss it. That's how I ended up spending my Saturday night in a dimly lit speakeasy called the 1923 Banana Club. When I arrived, I headed down a steep set of stairs, and before me was a huge wooden door. I needed a secret code to get in, which I didn't have. Luckily, I recognized someone I knew and I followed them in. A man named David Peavy greeted me. He owns the speakeasy and is a well-known Texarkana entrepreneur. I've interviewed him for other stories in the past. He wore an old-fashioned costume, a long, dark coat that almost dragged the floor, paired with a black top hat. I was given an off-brand playbill at the door, emblazoned with the title An Evening with the Phantom. In fine print below the bolded title, it said that the performance is in memory of the victims of the Phantom Killer. People began to trickle in, all chattering about the dinner and the show they were about to witness. Since the club is a new addition to downtown Texarkana, people were intrigued. The tickets sold fast. The lights around me dimmed. Everyone turned their attention to the stage. And I gave it out. I ruled Texarkana in 1946. I came back tonight to tell you all the story. The legend of what happened here in Texarkana. You driven down these same streets. You laughed in the places that I made a bet for mercy. But I can still hear the screams. Earlier that year, PV hired a handful of actors. And together, they wrote the script for this play. It's not meant to be historically accurate, and they take a lot of creative liberties. Without getting too deep into the plot, this play actually featured two different phantom killers, one of them being David Peavy's character. This goes to show how much interest there still is in these murders, even 77 years later. It also shows that after all this time, the phantom killer has become sort of a fictional character, like Freddy Krueger or Michael Myers. It's easy for people to forget that the victims involved were all real people. While I only stayed in Texarkana for three nights that weekend, a couple days after I left was the annual Town That Dreaded Sundown movie showing in Spring Lake Park. I'm glad I got to miss out on that one. I'm Peyton Sims. This is the final episode of Season 2 of Devilish Deeds. Over the last four episodes, you've heard the tragic stories of all eight victims of the Phantom Killer and you've also been introduced to the two main suspects. In this episode, I'll tell you about how this case is still relevant today and how people in Texarkana and across the country are working to find answers. And I can't tell you about that without reintroducing you to Jeremy Kennington, who you briefly heard from last episode. Jeremy's from Texarkana like me, but he's from the Arkansas side. And he's one of the modern-day web sleuths dedicated to researching the Phantom Killer. He even listed on the intro section of his personal Facebook page. His bio says, quote, I've researched the Phantom Killer extensively, and I have two daughters. What inspired me to start researching was, it kind of goes back to when my mother told me about the movie The Town That Dreaded Sundown. And... When she told me it was about Texarkana, I thought that was very interesting. So I watched it, and I thought, what was it 
what it was showing was true because that's what it claims. And then I wanted to do a project in high school on the story. And I wanted some information like from the actual newspapers. And I went to the library where they had that information and I read up on it. And I, that's when I realized it was nothing like the movie. And it inspired me to really look into what actually happened. And uh, that's where it pretty much began. Jeremy's the owner of the Wikipedia page for the Texarkana Phantom Killer. And he started a Facebook group called Texarkana Phantom Killer Theorem that's grown to more than 700 people. In this group, people share theories and personal stories about the Phantom Killer in hopes of untangling any loose threads from the case. That was to get more information from, like, people that I wouldn't think of that I'd possibly have connections with, uh, relatives and people that might know something to, to come on that group and have more information, provide more information. These types of groups are popular among modern-day true crime fanatics. There are groups for historical cold cases, like the Zodiac Killer murders, and even solved murders like the ones committed by disgraced former South Carolina lawyer Alex Murdaugh, who was found guilty earlier this year for killing his wife and son. And it was speculated that the man accused of killing four students at the University of Idaho in November of 2022 was posting in Facebook groups about the murders he allegedly committed. While working on this episode, I read some research into why people join these online communities. One of the most common reasons that came up is simple. People want to talk to people who have similar interests as they do. For instance, if you like playing a certain sport, you might join a group that's made for people who like the same sport as you. And if you're interested in true crime, you might join a true crime group. It's as simple as it sounds. The more I looked into this, my executive producer Katie Alka and I got really curious about the deeper reasons behind joining these specific types of groups. So Katie set up an interview with a real expert. I'm Amanda Vickery. I'm a professor and chair of the psychology department at Illinois Wesleyan University in Bloomington, Illinois. A lot of Amanda's research focuses around crime, including why women specifically have so much interest in true crime and how crime shows might affect people's knowledge of forensic science. Well, growing up, um, I was a true crime fan myself beginning at, at a young age. My mom gave me a true crime book in grade school to read, and since then I was hooked. So it's been interesting to see the, the interest just explode out of, out of this world. Um, but when you think about it, true crime is, is something you would think we wouldn't want to consume, right? People are getting murdered. They're getting um, assaulted. There's blood. There's gore. There's heartache. Why in the world do we want to listen to a crime podcast before we go to sleep at night? Amanda said that people are drawn to true crime stories for a variety of different reasons. But a lot of it goes back to basic survival instincts and biology. And I won't bore you with all the methodological details, but the bottom line is that um, people and women especially are drawn to true crime when they, when it's going to have something about the psychology of the killer, like what in his background caused him to kill or what set him off. And so when you step back and look at it all, you realize that it's all related to survival, right? If I know what turn someone into a killer or what in the situation caused this guy to go over the line and, and murder his wife or his girlfriend or something like that. Or if I learned how a victim escaped when they're, you know, being kidnapped in the trunk of a car, I can know how to try to prevent it from happening to me. But Amanda said there are reasons just beyond basic biological instinct. That's another innate thing within people. We want to be a part of a group, right? Back in the day, in our ancestral past, people who are part of groups were more likely to survive when you had to fight off predators and things like that. When you can just think about it in your own life, we don't want to feel ostracized. We want to feel like we belong and fit in. And I think that's what some of these groups are providing to people. They're talking to people who are similar to themselves, who are interested in the same thing. Sometimes they're sort of cheering each other on like, oh, you got the documents from the courthouse. Good job. Thanks so much for posting. I mean, that can, that can make you feel good. 
right? And I don't know anything about these people's personal lives. Maybe that's something I could do a, a do a study on. Actually, I could see the stereotype being you know, a single person without a partner or children or a job that has a bunch of time on their hands. But I don't know if that's true. I think some people just sort of latch on to this. Maybe they're not getting the sort of affirmation in their real lives and this is fulfilling something in them. My guess is it's different for every person that's on one of these sites. When I talked to Jeremy, it didn't seem like solving the case was his original intention for creating the Wikipedia page. He just wanted to clear up some of the misinformation going around about the murders. I want to say it was back in 2009 or 10, somewhere around there. Um, There was a page called Phantom Killer, but it didn't have a lot of information on that page, and it had a lot of false information too. So I started the Texture Cannon Moonlight Murders to kind of give it more detail, um, set the record straight basically. And uh, we eventually had to merge the two pages together. I felt like the Phantom Killer, um, that was the title of the page, only dealt with just that and not so much towards the event. It'd be like doing information on John Wayne Gacy himself as a person, but then like the events would be separate, you know. So I started that page. Jeremy told me he's not doing as much research these days as he used to, but he still checks the Facebook group for updates. You know, there's only so much you, information you can get, and then you kind of hit a dead end, and I felt like I've hit that dead end. I found out everything that I think I could know. And I just kind of rely on my um, Facebook uh, group for any new information that might come up from any possible relative or, you know, someone who knows something. A minute ago, you heard Jeremy refer to the case as the Moonlight Murders. This is another popular nickname for the phantom killings. But Dr. James Presley, the expert on this case, takes issue with that nickname. Uh, One thing that uh, they call it, I think they're uh, called it the Moonlight Murders. There's practically no moonlight at all then. While Jeremy was just a curious Texarkana native, the Facebook group also attracts people who are actually connected to the case. Like John Tennyson, the cousin of Duty Tennyson, one of the lead suspects in the case. Well, uh, I grew up in the 1970s, and uh, as you know, in 1976, Charles Pierce released his movie, The Town That Dreaded Sundown, and uh, because of the publicity related to that film, Uh, my family started talking about the Phantom Killings and told me that I had had a cousin who at one time claimed to have been the Phantom Killer, but that everyone believed he had been ruled out. Uh, It turns out he was not ruled out, but that was really the first interest in the Phantom Killings. John said he didn't pay much attention to the Phantom Killer after that. Until... I was at Stanford University in California, and the World Wide Web was starting to get more user-friendly, and... There was, I came across a, one of the suicide notes of my cousin where he claimed responsibility for some of the murders, at least. And, uh, he, and someone had transcribed it. And that was in the mid nineties, uh, at Stanford. And, uh, I started, I said, hmm, that's interesting. I'd, n- I'd never really seen the verbatim transcription of the note, but I remembered people saying he had been ruled out. And I was saying, I wonder how he was ruled out. So I started looking into it more. And, uh, but then also I was, because I was a medical student, I, I had other responsibilities. But then in 2013, I heard that a new movie was being made and that rekindled my interest as well. So I started, I picked up the research again in 2013. And uh, that's where I met some other people, local people in Texarkana who were also researching the phantom killings. I met him in May of 2022 in Texarkana's Wadley Hospital. My boyfriend's dad is a doctor, and he generously let me borrow his office so I could have a conversation with John. John doesn't currently live in Texarkana. He drove in from San Antonio, Texas. But he seemed happy to be here, enthusiastic about being able to unleash his wealth of knowledge about the case. Talking to him reminded me of talking to a friend's dad, who's ready to gush about a hobby for as long as you'll sit and listen. He's been studying this case for a while and has published his findings across the web. 
He has a website compiling information about every detail that concerns his cousin and the Phantom Killer. Everything from the headlines to the possible connections between duty and the victims, it's all there. One well-known researcher of the Phantom Killer once asked me the question, he said, why are you trying to convince the public that your cousin was the Phantom Killer? And I said, I'm not. I said, I, said, I, don't, I don't know. You know, I'm agnostic on that question. He spent years researching his cousin's alleged involvement in the murders. And even he doesn't have a definite answer. But he told me he does disagree with the most popular theory on who did it. But what I have done is tried to do, uh, do a comparative analysis of the evidence of H.B. or Duty Tennyson compared to the other most well-known suspect, which is Ewell Swinney. And I tell people this, I say that if I were making a forced dichotomous choice, just comparing the evidence for Ewell Swinney versus that of H.B. Tennyson, and I didn't have any other possible suspect, then I would, I think H.B. Tennyson is more likely to have been the Phantom Killer than Ewell Swinney. And I can cite several reasons why I believe that to be the case. Um, but I always tell people that it's possible that there's another person who we may maybe ne never even heard of who could actually be the perpetrator. So um, I think it's, I don't, I would be very surprised if we ever have full confidence as to who the Phantom Killer was or if it was more than one person who they might be. Um, I doubt we'll ever know. Kelly Rowland is also involved in the online Phantom Killer community. You heard from her in episode 3. Her mom was best friends with victim Betty Jo Booker. Despite her involvement in the group, like others I've spoken to, she's not hopeful that the case will be solved. I had hope for a little while when I found out all the physical evidence was gone. I, it it kind of dashed my hope. Um, because really we do need that to move forward. I think there were enough investigators that looked at the FBI files and enough people that have looked at the F FBI files that if there were anything to really be found in there that could make any earth-shattering discoveries, it would have been found by now. The FBI files for the case have since been released online. There are more than a thousand pages. I had an FBI agent come talk to my classes and uh, we were discussing this. Um, Actually, no, it was a parent-teacher conference. I had his child in class, and he came in, and, and it was about the time of the Phantom Killer Forum. And so on my board, I had the date and time and everything of the Phantom Killer Forum. And so when he came in, he, he said, uh, I see you got the Phantom Killer Forum up there. And I said, oh, yeah, that's an event that we're doing. We've kind of been looking into the cases. And he just looked at me, shook his head. He said, I wish I'd have known that. And I said, why? And he said, Last week, I moved those files to Waco, and I, I just I just wanted to cry because, <laughs> I mean, that was their files. My executive producer, Katie, and I went through all 1,118 pages of the files. The documents are incredibly extensive, and it's kind of amazing to see this much information about the case. When she and I sat down to talk about the documents, Katie had gone through the first half. So, Katie, tell me, what have you been doing? I have gone through um, what I believe is around 527 of the <laughs> oh my god of the more than 1,100 FBI documents for sort of fact checking purposes for these episodes. And I know you've seen some of the stuff that's in these, but I took it upon myself to go through all of them. And there's a lot in here. So it starts when the FBI gets involved in the case, which is. The papers are dated starting on April 15th, 1946. And so they start with the murders of Paul Martin. The first thing that surprised me is that the documents don't really mention the first attack or the first double murder. They start with the second double murder. Because it's like, I guess maybe they were like letting local folks handle those early ones. I don't know. Hmm. So that's where we start. And it's like. Pretty much a lot of, like, just, like, office memos back and forth. So, like, J. Edgar Hoover was the director of the FBI at this point, mm -hmm. which is kind of an interesting little, like, historical, like, context for this. So there's a lot of letters to and from Sheriff Presley to J. Edgar Hoover and stuff back and forth. There's, like, a lot of photocopied newspapers. Like, one of them is an article from the Washington Times Herald, and there's, like, handwriting on it that just says, what is our jurisdiction? Basically... It's page after page of the FBI trying to figure out what they need to do and who they need to talk to. It's clear that they're trying to get caught up, basically. So there's like 
the Texas Rangers are sending like are like mailing bullets and cartridges to FBI testing locations. So it's a lot of like inter office. We're sending you these bullets. We're sending you this. Can you test them? And and all of that stuff. Then the documents get interesting. About 10 pages in, we've got our first mention of a suspect, which raised my antenna because I was like, I've never heard this name before. Um, but it, there's like all kinds of information about him. Um, there's like his social security number. No info about why he was a suspect, though. Just like, can y'all look into this guy? I don't know. Can you say his name? Yeah, it's Claude Wesley Varble. He's from Dallas. Um, Never heard of that name. Exactly. At all. This ends up happening a lot in these documents. A name will come up, and then either it'll never appear again in the documents, or another document will show up saying the fingerprints don't match, or they've somehow figured out that the guy wasn't the guy something about a hitchhiker there's something about another suspect some guy who works in the alcohol tax department like literally this is just a rolodex of names at this point there's something about blood from the fender of a car parked near the starks and then on june 28th 1946 we get a document saying all logical suspects have been eliminated so we're back at square one so, so that's, that's almost two months after the Starks murder. Right. Interestingly, Yul Swinney and Duty Tennyson don't come up for a really, really long time in these documents. Really? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, not a really, really long time, but like months. Too long. Too long. Longer than I expected, yeah. at least. After Yul Swinney comes up in the documents, he's mentioned a lot. As you heard last episode, Dr. Presley thinks Yul Swinney most likely was the phantom killer. And from these documents, it seems like detectives were looking at him really, really closely. There's a lot of back and forth in the documents about the different evidence police found to connect Swinney to the crime. You probably remember some of this from last episode. There was that piece of cloth that looked like it had Virgil Stark's last name printed on it. Elsewhere in the documents, Katie found a letter from the mother of Paul Martin, one of the Phantom Killer's victims, to J. Edgar Hoover, who was the head of the FBI at the time. There was also some communication about how a bullet from the scene of Paul's murders had been lost at some point, which for me was just further indication of how messy this entire investigation was. There's also a ton, and I mean a ton, of random suspect names in these documents. So then, we come back to Yul Swinney and Peggy, our, our Bonnie and Clyde. Mm-hmm. This is where we start getting Peggy giving a statement and taking back the statement and giving a statement and taking back the statement. Um, so this is where we start hearing more stuff about evidence being pulled from the stolen car that Peggy had that Yul pieced out and left her with. Mm-hmm. Um, there's like fiber seat covers, a floor mat clothes, whatever. During all of this, it seems like they're going in really hard on Yul Swinney, but they're still like pulling in other random I stopped writing them down because like by this point in the documents, we were probably in the 20s or 30s of just like random men's names being thrown out. Um, And no explanation for why they thought they were connected. Like there's a few memos about a man who hijacked a taxi driver in Uvalde and was, like, shooting at the driver to get him to drive him to San Antonio, which was on the complete opposite side of the state. Yeah. And they're, like... And they related the, that to this case? They were examining the bullets from that car hijacking. So they were that desperate. Yeah. And Uvalde... Let's see. Uvalde to Texarkana. I didn't search this earlier. Uvalde to Texarkana. It's 533 miles The documents also revealed that the FBI ended up spending a ton of time on what essentially turned out to be a wild goose chase. But it's something that has led to a lot of speculation around this case. Last episode, I told you that some people in Texarkana thought that Virgil Stark's murder might have occurred because he was having affairs with women around town, and maybe his death was revenge for an affair. The FBI documents revealed where that affair theory might have come from. You might remember that in the last episode, 
Jeremy Kennington mentioned a man who had been accused of poisoning his wife. The FBI documents get a lot deeper into that story. Like pretty much everything in this story, it's complicated. So let me play some of the tape from my conversation with Katie to break it down for you. So summer, late summer, 1946, is when this comes up. So there's a memo in here from the sheriff in Miller County, Arkansas, so the Arkansas side of Texarkana, Mm -hmm. outlining that her death was suspicious. The sheriff thinks she might have been poisoned, but they didn't find poison in her system. Her husband claims she died of Bright's disease, which I googled, and it's this type of kidney disease. But in the autopsy, there was no evidence of this disease. Um, And so at any rate, they seem to think that this husband was a suspicious character, Mm -hmm. which, sure. And so after that, there are some documents implicating him in both his wife's death and potentially Virgil Starks' death, which is where these affair theories come in. So So it all starts with this poisoning? At least in these documents, it starts with this poisoning. There's this, like, kind of speculation that maybe Starks was having an affair with this woman and the husband poisoned her and then killed Starks. Mm. That goes nowhere. Then the focus shifts back to Peggy Swinney. Her parents convince her to tell the truth, so she gives her a third statement, the one you heard Dr. Pressey read to us in the last episode. So then, this is where things go really off the rails because law enforcement gets, like, mad distracted because they're are these letters, these extortion letters. So there are these handful of people in town who start getting these mysterious letters, some of them typewritten, some of them handwritten, that are basically extorting them. In the first letter, the writer demanded that a Texarkana man bring $3,000 to a meetup point in Spring Lake Park. Another letter is sent to Betty Jo Booker's stepdad. Another is sent to Captain Gonzalez, the Texas Ranger who helped investigate the case. And this goes on for, like, a couple hundred pages in these FBI documents. There's so much back and forth about this. So they start figuring out, like, what kind of typewriter were these written on, how many of these typewriters are in the Texarkana area. So they track it down to this real estate office, and they match the handwriting from some of the handwritten letters to this woman who works at the real estate office named Madeline Mary James. She was arrested for extortion, basically. One of the guys she wrote letters to said she had had difficulties in the past with neighbors, but it didn't say what. Later on in the documents, we find out that she's like sort of the cranky neighbor. She's like, don't let your kids play on my lawn. She's like accusing Betty Jo's stepdad of being a peeping Tom, like just kind of a problem neighbor. Um, She's around 40 years old, around 40 years old. Um, And then her boss, the guy who owns the real estate agency, is like, she's mentally unstable, which tracks with this information from the documents. The extortion letter started in April 1946, two months after the first phantom killer attacks, and just before Virgil and Katie Starks were attacked in their home. The investigation into the letters lasted into September 1947. And then this is in September 1947, we find out that these suspects that she's naming in these letters are just people that she had beef with, basically. Just random names that she's throwing out there. Meantime, the FBI agents are like tracking down every single suspect named in these letters. So she sort of inadvertently sends law enforcement on this wild goose chase. Her case goes to trial. She's found incompetent to stand trial. Charges are dismissed because she's mentally unwell. Um, I don't know what happens to her after that. But it just made me wonder if, like, investigators being on this wild goose chase impacted the real murderer slipping through the cracks. You know what I mean? Because they were dealing Mm -hmm. with all of this. And then the FBI goes back to focusing on Yul Swinney again. So in October 1948, the FBI asks for a fingerprint fingerprint comparison with Peggy and Yul Swinney's fingerprints and the ones at Paul and Betty Joe's murder. We already know those don't match. Yul Swinney is in the penitentiary in Huntsville, Texas at this point for Grand Theft Auto or whatever. He's serving his life sentence. An inmate, two inmates recently released from the same prison 
have told Sheriff Presley of Texarkana that Yul Swinney said, quote, if that woman ever talks, they will, will surely stick me for them, meaning the murders. And Peggy had divorced Yule by this point. They got divorced in August of 1948. So that's interesting. We've got this, like, semi-jailhouse confession. Then it's not until November of 1948 that we get a duty Tennyson mention in these documents. And all of that is it starts with a letter from Sheriff Presley to J. Edgar Hoover, director of the FBI, saying, I've got these fingerprints of this young man, recently deceased. Can you compare them? And so they start doing that. But then Sheriff Presley is like, what if y'all just tested all of the fingerprints that we have in the sheriff's office and the police department on both sides of Texarkana? So four law enforcement departments, fingerprints. It's 20,000 sets of fingerprints that they start testing, which is good in theory. But how long did that take? Months. Then the documents dive deeper into the potential suspects. There are more than 200 pages of suspect names and their fingerprint results spanning into the 1960s, nearly 20 years after the attacks. There are enough names in these FBI documents to keep the web sleuths trying to solve this crime busy for years. This is like feeding the web sleuths, for better or for worse, right? Because there are, like, endless names. There are endless... Like, there's this list of 102 suspects on that second document, but before that, there were, like, several dozen that had come up in these documents that, yes, were ruled out with, like, their fingerprints didn't match, but, like, there are all these, like, rabbit holes you could go down with these people, and it's just, like, one of these online sleuths' playground. The last hundred or so pages feature more information about the extortion case, comparing handwriting and typewriter pages, and then they just end. These FBI documents confirmed everything I already believed about this case. Law enforcement didn't have any real suspects other than Yul Swinney. And in the case against Swinney, the evidence was all circumstantial. They never charged him with a crime. And so that's where we're at with, with the FBI documents. And I found it so interesting going through these because we were able to cross-reference stuff that we've already talked about in this podcast, but it's... The impression that you get reading these is frustration and desperation from law enforcement. And there is, like, for me, a feeling of, like, like frustration at them for, like, continuing to bungle it. But also, like, I, you can feel their frustration as well. And so it's, like, it's just a really frustrating read, honestly. Katie's right. It's frustrating. But it's also reassuring in a way to know that despite the missteps that law enforcement made with contaminated crime scenes and evidence, they continued to work towards identifying the killer for more than a decade after the murders. There's not much peace to be found in this story, but there's maybe one small thing those looking for resolution could hold on to. The FBI continued to work on this case, and they released all these documents in hope that someone, somewhere, would see a name that they recognized, or they drew a page that unlocked a memory they'd forgotten about. And then this case would finally be solved. Maybe one day, a web sleuth will find a name that's hiding deep within the stack of documents that will remind them of a faint memory. And just like that, the murders could be solved. At least, we can only hope. Working on this podcast has been a little bit like taking a journey into my own personal history, considering this happened in my hometown. I was able to learn more about Texarkana than I ever thought I needed to know. But it's also unlocked some troubling memories for me, including one that, like so many of the stories I've shared in this podcast, involves a dirt road and a gunman. Mom and Dad, I didn't tell you about this, so keep listening at your own risk. It was February of 2021, the same month the first phantom killer attack happened in 1946. My boyfriend and I had been dating for only a month at this point. 
we were still in the honeymoon phase. We just finished hanging out with some of our friends. We had a bonfire, we cooked dinner, and we played some card games. But eventually, it was time for us to leave. We went for a drive along a dirt road that we'd visited before. My boyfriend killed the headlights, and we looked up at the stars through the sunroof. My boyfriend and I talked and laughed. We were seniors in high school at this point. I remember us writing our bucket list on an old piece of notebook paper we found in the back seat. We wrote that we wanted to learn how to dance. We wanted to have a picnic date. We wanted to get into college at the University of Texas. We were both there for hours. While we were lost in each other's thoughts, midnight snuck up on us. Luckily, our parents weren't the type to ground us if we were out too late. That's if they found out. But despite the hour, I thought I saw headlights in the distance. I told myself that it had to be another couple finding somewhere to park. But as the truck got closer, it began slowing down until it was right next to us. That's when a man stumbled out of the vehicle. I hunkered down in the passenger seat and covered my eyes. The man pointed a flashlight into my boyfriend's truck, blinding us in the process. Then he pounded on the window. I asked my boyfriend to drive away, but he didn't. Instead, he said he was going to get out. I thought this was a dumb idea, but I guess he wanted to prove he was a man. In the meantime, I crawled onto the floorboard and covered myself with a jacket. I waited for what felt like forever for my boyfriend to get back into the truck. When he eventually did, he locked the doors and immediately drove off. That's when he told me the man had pointed a gun at him. He said it looked like an assault rifle, but it was hard to tell in the dark. He told me the man's passenger seat was littered with empty beer cans. Through his slurred speech, he said he was out, quote, patrolling the land, which we're certain wasn't private property. That's the last time we went on a dirt road date. Back then, I wasn't thinking about how similar this night was to the last nights of the victims I've discussed throughout this podcast. But I think about it a lot now. When you're a teenager, there's not much to do but drive around. It's hard to get alone time with your boyfriend or crush, because when you're a young person, it feels like there's always an adult looking over your shoulder. All the people the Phantom Killer murdered, they wanted the same thing my boyfriend and I did. Some time alone together, some peace and quiet, a dirt road, and the stars. But the difference is that my boyfriend and I made it home. We both got to put our heads on our pillows at the end of the night. The memory of our eventful date still fresh in our minds. Which was something many of the Phantom Killer's victims never got to do. So I want to take a moment to acknowledge each of these victims because their stories have impacted me. I don't want this story to just be an unsolved case that people want to solve. I want answers, but because the victims deserve it, not because it's a fun mystery or puzzle. I wish Jimmy Hollis and Mary Jean Larry didn't have to endure the never-ending trauma that haunted the both of them for the rest of their lives. From the dinner, the movie, the late-night cafe, it was obvious that Richard Griffin and Polly Ann Moore wanted the night to last forever, and I wish they could have gotten the happy ending they deserved. I have a feeling that I would have been friends with Betty Jo Booker, especially since we both went to the same high school. When I was 15, I'd have slumber parties with my friends after we drove around trying to find something to do. And Paul Martin's energy and enthusiasm reminds me of my guy friends that are still in my friend group today. I can't imagine my home that I consider to be a safe haven, becoming a murder scene in the matter of a single night. I wish Virgil Stark's home hadn't been violated, and I wish his grieving wife, Katie, didn't have to have both her husband and her home taken from her. It's a long shot, but if anyone has tips on the Phantom Killer case, the website is tips.fbi.gov. These innocent victims deserve justice, and their families deserve answers. And I hope that even 77 years later, this notorious unsolved case can finally be closed.
This season of Devilish Deeds was reported, produced, and hosted by me, Peyton Sims. The executive producer is Katie Pinkshigautka. Katie also did the editing and sound design for this podcast, with editing assistance from Sewa Oliveras. The associate producers are Jade Emerson, Aurora Berry, and Liv Gamble. I'd also like to thank Dr. James Presley for allowing me to reference his best-selling book, The Phantom Killer, throughout this podcast. Because of his diligent research, all five episodes of this season were possible. I'd like to say a special thanks to my boyfriend, Asad Malik, who you heard me mention in a couple episodes. He not only read over some of the first drafts of my scripts, but he also helped produce a promotional video. The Drag's marketing and communications manager is Sophia Vargas Karam. Alexa Georgelos designed the cover art, and I took the photo. The Drag is an audio production house within Texas Student Media at the Moody College of Communication at the University of Texas at Austin. Special thanks to Robert Quigley, Rachel Davis Mercy, and Gerald Johnson. The Drag is a nonprofit educational program that gives students like me hands on audio storytelling experience. If you want to support our work and help us create podcasts like this one, visit thedragaudio.com slash donate.